evening. Welcome to the final night of See and Learn 2023. Our wettest See and Learn on record. <laughs> so may tonight be no exception, but thank you everyone for coming out and being brave to weather it. You're not made of salt. Little rain never hurt anybody. And good evening to our, home, our people who stayed home and tuned in, so thank you for that. We have a full program tonight. But we are going to start with a recap. But before we get to that, I want to do a special thank you to our team. Um, our new hire, Beth, is in Grand Cayman doing a big fundraiser, diving with Sylvia Earle today. So when you watch this, Beth, know that we did a shout out to Beth, and we look forward to her working with us going forward. Um, and many of you know Emily our uh, super power. <laughs> you're supposed to stand up, Emily. <laughs> and you're going to see more of her this evening, so I'm just getting this started. But a major thank you. She is an absolute driving force in this foundation for all of our projects. So a big uh, applause for Emily. And then we have Grace, who wants to be a kindergarten teacher, and she's going to be darn good at it because she is who dealt with a lot of our kids' programs. So you guys know Grace, and she's going to come up. So the next thing we're going to do, you're going to give her a big round of applause. And she also does some behind-the-scenes work, so she did the trivia question. So we're turning it over to Grace. Thank you, Lynn. All right. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hi, <laughs> Hi, Canadian fellow Canadians. <laughs> I love that you guys are here. It's like a little taste of home. Um, okay, so we're going to do the trivia game. Okay, so our first expert is Erin Moulton, and she did deep ocean exploration with the ROV. And her trivia question is, name at least one element found in deep sea nodules. Lithium. Yes, yes. Good. So if you, so, sorry. So if you want, if you win, if you get the answer correct for when we go along through the questions, just yell out your um, size of your t-shirt and we're giving away our, the rest of our t-shirts to the winners. So, Larry and Cherry. Larry and Cherry. Yeah. What t-shirt do you want? Yeah. For anyone. You can no. anyone. <laughs> yeah, you could take it home and give it to someone, a family member. So our next, our next expert was Nathan Robinson, and he did a study on life of tur uh, sea turtles. So his question is, how do, sea, how do turtle hatchlings synchronize their hatchling and emergence from their nest? So the answer is they vocalize, communicate among one another while in their egg chamber. Yeah. Hey Larry, it's time to go. Hey, All right. So our it was Larry and Cherry who caught it again. They only want one turn. Extra small. Okay. Our next expert was Will Barnes. He did a study on the Saba Bank sinkholes. And his question is, although Saba sinkholes are likely the deepest and widest on the planet, what makes them most unique? They're in Saba, yeah. <laughs> 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 I wasn't here, but I wouldn't even try. <laughs> yeah, Otto. <laughs> Okay, so the answer is 
They are formed by a process that has not been described before. Yeah. But we have a bonus question for him. <laughs> so name two of the sinkhole shape names Will used rather than north, south, east, and west to describe the sinkholes on the Looms Bank. Do we know? Good. Good. What is your t-shirt size? Extra large. And yes, the answer is heart pig dolphin and her majesty sideways. Very interesting nicknames. Okay, our next expert is Maura Scanlon, and she did um, her work on bees. How many species of bees are there worldwide? A billion, uh, not a little quite. High. <laughs> That's a little, yeah, high. No. Popeye and Grace? No. A little lower, a little lower. Oh. A little higher. 25,000. Good. Sally, Sally what's, your, what's your t-shirt size? Large. Large. Awesome, so 25,000. Okay, and our next expert was Paul Sickle, and he did a study on fish parasites. And his question is, why are there more parasites on degraded reefs? She's close. Yeah. Okay, so the answer is because there is not enough living corals to eat the parasites. Why well, I put a picture of a sad fish with a parasite. <laughs> okay, our next expert was Ian Housen, Hewsons, sorry, um, and he did a study on diadema die off. And his question was where is Philaster? The ciliate, ciliate that killed off the diadema in 2022 commonly found. What animal is it normally found? Yes. <laughs> yeah, an animal. Coral. I, who said coral? <laughs> Lindsay right, said right, it. Okay. <laughs> what <Yeah>. coral, Lindsay? <laughs> yeah. Yes. What's your t-shirt size? <laughs> no, 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 our next expert is Natalie, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, De Borge, and she did her study on iguanas. And her question was, how can you tell the difference between the endemic Sabin black iguana and invasive green iguana? She's, she's close. Good, Sally. All right. So... So the answer is the Sabin black iguana has a black spot between eye and tim tim tympanum and no horn on its nose. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So our next expert is Aaron Pilnick and he did a study on coral restoration and he did um, his activity with the kids on, um, what is it called? Virtual, um, virtual reality, which was really cool. Yeah, in the schools. And his question was, what are different environmental factors that affect, affect when coral spawn? Who is that? What is your t-shirt size? <laughs> Take it home. 
Okay, extra large Lynn for Brad. Okay, and the answer, you're correct, lunar cycle, sea surface temperature, and photo period, length of daylight, and insulation, solar radiation. Okay, our next expert, Lauren Salmonitis, Sim Sim um, she did her um, work on inking, and her question is, what is ink composed of? Sorry? <laughs> not, not quite. Not quite. Come on, Otto, you can, you can do it. Awesome, you got one of them right. Yeah, mucus and? <laughs> okay, so the answer is melanin and mucus. So good job, Otto. What's your t-shirt size? Medium. Okay. And she has a bonus question. What is a third component of... Um, what is it? Pig pygmy, thank you. And dwarf spent whale ink. Sperm. 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 Yeah. What is sperm whale? Oh, sperm whale. Rosalind? Oh, yes, good job. Feces. Good job. All right. Okay. Our next expert was Dixie Sanborn, and she did her study on uh, cacao, 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 sorry. I can never say this word. And her question was, what do cacao, ketchup, pumpkin pie, and grape jelly all have in common? They're delicious. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, you got it right. So she got it. So they all come from fruits, specifically berries. That's right. So it's your shirt size that you're going to... Can I get one for my granddaughter? Well, you got it right. So. Medium. Okay. Okay, our next expert was Joshua Manning. He did a study on ecology of parrotfishes. How does parrotfish size affect their home ranges? Yes. Okay, so the answer is larger species have larger home ranges and core areas. Good. And his bonus question, besides feeding on macroalgae and dead coral, what is a more nutritional snack for parrotfish? <laughs> what do you think? You got it, you got it, Cherry. <laughs> Other fish is poop. <laughs> okay, our next expert, Lindsay Hubner. She did her study on octocorals. And her question is, why are octocorals taken over reefs? Good, that's correct. The answer is faster growth rates, 100 times as fast as stony corals, and therefore also faster at recovering from disturbances. And our next expert, Ian McGaw, and his study of land crabs, yes. And his question is, land crabs have evolved to be mainly terrestrial animals. What is the main problem that they face? Sorry? Yeah. Okay. So the answer is water loss. Okay. And this is our next expert we have tonight who's doing her presentation, Katie Flowers, on technology to monitor rays. 
And that's all. We don't have a trivia question. So that's the end of our trivia. Thank you for participating. Okay, so we know next time everybody needs to rewatch the live feed so you get the better question. No, you have excuses. <laughs> Popeye, I was disappointed. How did you not get any of those? Okay, so as we move on for our keynote speaker this evening, we already said that. Thank you. All right, sorry. We're going to get moving and talk about some normal things. Uh, for the last time, we're going to thank Care of Trans, who generously supports our live streaming events. And if you live here, they're a great uh, source for moving cargo. So uh, Cloudbreak Villa is an absolute beautiful villa, as you can see from those photographs. They have been very generous sponsors over the years, sponsoring our raffle and supporting our scientists. Tonight's speaker, as well as last night's speaker, are sponsored uh, by Cloud, Cloud Break, not Cloud Top, sorry, Cloud Break Villa. Thank you very much, uh, Casey and her husband, Steve. Oh, yes, sir. They're my friends. And yes, they are your friends, too, and that's important. Uh, this program would not be sp uh, possible without the financial support of Prince Bernard Culture Fund's public entity, SABA, which means our government. So a round of applause for that. <laughs> and all of our sponsors, uh, every hotel, restaurant, uh, business, ferry, dive shops, the Lions Club, Winair, uh, Makana Ferry, Hassle Free, Vernon said he was coming tonight because Vernon also sponsored getting our beer here. Uh, so as you see, there's many, many. A uh, round of applause for everyone, please. And there's a few new faces in the crowd tonight. So if you take a picture of this QR code, you can download the new platform, which is uh, wonderful to use when you're on SABA to make sure you don't miss out on any of the nature highlights or the entities that support cultural heritage. And there's also great interviews on there from a number of local people and old timers. Uh, okay, you have, uh, let's see, between now and the end of the presentation, if you're not too disruptive, you could buy more raffle tickets. And right after the presentation, we will go through the raffles and all the winners will be joyous. <laughs> I think we know about the t-shirts by now. <laughs> and everybody's got more than one, maybe. So, uh, and the, But we, are, uh, we do have some excess because we had some people not show up this month due to the weather. So if you'd want to purchase any to take home, they are for sale uh, for $20. That's for our people online or anywhere. I can bring them up when I go home for Christmas and mail them to you. Okay, raise your hand if you're enjoying Cloud Top. Woo! And a special thanks to the makers of Cloud Top, Bastet Brewery, the absolute incredible Erica Moulton and her foundation, C, um, um, sorry, help me out there. Yeah, let's just say C4OE. Um, Vernon and his team at Hassle Free and Seba Tourism and the GeoWatch, which is a water monitoring organization. So let's get on for our keynote speaker tonight. Our last presentation of the year focuses on another iconic underwater species, stingrays. If you're a diver or a snorkeler, who doesn't love seeing rays? If you've ever been diving on Seba, chances are you've seen southern stingrays. But what if that southern stingray was actually a whole different species? This is a reason to come back, because yesterday our field project dive did not allow us to go to the dive site that we think they are most prolific on. So stay tuned. Katie Flowers is a postdoctoral fellow in ray biology and conservation at Moat Marine Laboratory. At Moat, Katie will study the biology and ecology of rays in the greater Caribbean region in order to identify major threats to populations, support the management and recovery of threatened species, 
Descri describe key habitats and refine geographic distributions. She is a passionate advocate for science-based conservation and her collaborative efforts led to extended marine protected area boundaries for reef and shark, sorry, for reef sharks and full protection of all rays in Belize. Raise your hand for Katie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. And it's so wonderful to be here. I never imagined having to come all the way to a dormant volcano to hang out with so many fellow Canadians. <laughs> but here we are. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, Lynn already gave an introduction, and most of you know me at this point. So I'm not going to say too much, but I would like to take the time to thank a previous expert, Matt Potensky. Um, who also studied stingrays. I'm not sure what year he was here. He was here three times. Three times. So Matt Potensky was kind enough to connect me with Lynn, Emily, and Grace um, so that I would be able to be here tonight and talk about my research. Um, so of course, thank you to uh, Emily, Grace, and Lynn for their amazing dedication to this program. So a lot of you here are already divers and water-loving folk, so you're already biased. Um, but I often like to ask people what they think about when they see or hear the word stingray. Because you might be surprised to know that it's not always the fish. Can anybody else have a guess of what that might be? Car. The car, exactly. And my, my dad's a car lover, so I love to make this connection. And it is a beautiful car. Um, so. And actually, when we look at popular social media sites, uh, which I no longer have, but that's a different story, um, we actually see that uh, the most popular posts are actually still related to the car that was designed off of the fish. So one of my career goals is to make the fish as popular as the car. So this is Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. This is where I'm currently located. It is a nonprofit organization that, of course, has a research laboratory as well as an aquarium. We are located in Sarasota, Florida, um, and that's about a little over 2,000 kilometers to where we are today. It was founded in 1955 as Cape Hayes Marine Laboratory, uh, thanks to philanthropist Anne Vanderbilt, who supported the incredible Dr. Eugenie Ginny Clark. Um, she was a famous shark biologist and ichthyologist, which is a fancy word for fish biologist. Um, so her work on shark behavior actually led her to be affectionately known as the shark lady. So I feel very lucky to work in such a place with an amazing history. Of course, we had other amazing legends in marine science come through the doors at Moat, uh, including directing Moat, um, like Drs. Perry Gilbert and Sylvia Earle. So Moat today is led by our current president and CEO, CEO Dr. Michael Crosby. And we have over 20 research programs at Moat Marine Laboratory. But perhaps one of Dr. Crosby's most ambitious projects yet is our new science education aquarium, where we hope to uh, make science, uh, marine science accessible to everyone. So this new aquarium is in the process of being built um, in Sarasota. So make sure in the next couple years you keep up with uh, the, the progress and come visit us. And the reason I bring this up is because um, it, this has a special connection for me and my background. Um, I, I am, was really attracted to working at Moat because experiential learning and hands-on learning was a really important part of my story. So I grew up in a really small town called We're Only Brunswick. And at the time this photo was taken, um, the population was about 272. So we were surrounded by incredible forests and green uh, landscape. So I didn't get to see a lot of the ocean, but my parents were really incredible in taking the time uh, to visit public aquaria and take me to the ocean and really foster that love uh, for the ocean as I grew up. But for some reason, I don't know why, I still felt that I was not capable of being a scientist. Um, I thought, I'm going to go be a high school teacher, and I'm going to teach uh, French and English literature. 
Um, but during my journey, I found, uh, discovered anthropology, and I actually really loved it. So I got my Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology, which of course has been very helpful to the work that I do today because conservation is not always just about the animals, but it's mostly about people and their behavior. So I eventually came to my senses, which was about halfway through my undergraduate degree, and I learned how to scuba dive uh, in the Bay of Fundy. <laughs> So uh, I realized that this was really my passion and I needed to figure out a way to follow it, but I knew I had a lot of catching up to do. So I, raised, I saved a lot of money and I started volunteering on different marine science projects around the world. Um, I volunteered on a dolphin photo ID project in Greece. I also did an extra semester abroad at the School for Field Studies in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Uh, there I was mentored by the incredible Dr. Aaron Henderson, who you see there with me, uh, and the lemon shark. And there I really fell in love with sharks and rays, particularly rays. I needed to continue making some money, uh, but also gaining experience in the field. So I went and I worked as a snow crab fisheries observer in the lower north shore of Quebec. Um, so I had a really a great time with some of the crews there. And finally, I volunteered on a whale shark, um, white shark photo ID project in South Africa with Oceans Research. So I was really building up this hands-on learning um, to try to build my CV. And again, I had to make some money, so I went and I worked in Newfoundland and Labrador, where of course Ian is working. And I worked with Coastal Explorers Field School and Oceans Learning Par Partnership as a marine science educator for K-12 science programs. I was mentored by the incredible Captain Yen Negrine, who is one of the best storytellers I've ever met in my life. And so I hope that tonight I can share some of his passion for storytelling and in, in the stories that I have to share. Finally, all of this started to pay off. I got accepted into a master's in marine conservation and policy at Stony Brook University. And there I was able to continue studying white spotted eagle rays uh, using photo ID and identifying individuals uh, using their unique spot patterns. And most recently, I finished my PhD at Florida International University. I was under the mentorship of Dr. Yanis Papasamachu in the Predator Ecology and Conservation Lab. There I studied how sharks influence the behavior of stingrays in Caribbean coral reef ecosystems. And I have to make a shout out to him tonight because he was kind enough to share all of the field gear and equipment uh, that we used this week in some of our activities. And I was very blessed as well during my PhD uh, to be able to continue with a hands-on learning and sharing that with citizen scientists uh, through Earthwatch Institute, we were able to bring uh, community members with us and, and actually help us conduct our research. So my long-winded background story there was to show how much I really value experiential learning and what we're doing here, uh, bringing divers and scientists together as well as the community. Um, and I will talk more about this as I go through my presentation. So now that I'm at Moat, one of my goals is actually to develop a ray biology and conservation program. And that was really only made possible by the incredible work that Kim Bassis Hall uh, has done over the past 20 years, really pioneering uh, research on the white spotted eagle ray. Um, she's currently in the Sharks and Rays Conservation Research Program, which is directed by my partner, Dr. Damian Chapman, who is here uh, with us tonight. So feel free if you have shark questions, go chase them down. <laughs> so uh, today I hope I can help you all appreciate the need uh, for more research uh, in the field. And I know you all are already excited about stingrays. So just to grab your attention, uh, let's play a little game and see how knowledgeable you are. I want to make sure uh, that you know the difference between a shark and a ray. I think everyone in this room should know which one's a shark and which one's a ray here. I don't doubt that. But let's make it a little more challenging. Shark, OK. Good job. So does anybody know, what are the physical characteristics for why that's a shark? The gills, yep. And what about the gills? Vertical. Underneath on a ray, and on a shark, they're on the side. I didn't need to play this game. You all already know this. What about this? Is this a shark or a ray? It is a ray. Did you know that too? Awesome. Okay, let's go over some of those characteristics that everyone's already pointed out. So uh, sharks have gill slits on the side of their body, whereas rays have their gill slits on the underside of their body. 
Sharks have their pectoral fins disconnected from their head, whereas rays' pectoral fins are connected to their head. And for anyone who's still unsure about that angel shark, the first picture that I showed, this is a picture of its underside. And I just wanted to highlight um, that those pectoral fins are actually disconnected from the head, and the gill slits do wrap around the side of the body. So what is a ray? Well, um, they live in both marine and freshwater environments. There are four orders, including stingrays and their relatives, electric rays, shovel nose rays, and skates, which typically live in deeper water or temperate waters. Um, they are actually the most diverse group of elasmobranch fishes, so cartilaginous fishes, those that have uh, cartilage as their skeleton and not bone. There's over 680 described species currently and counting. So not all rays have barbs, only stingrays. Um, so the one on the left here, this is actually an electric ray. And the difference between a ray and a skate is um, rays actually give birth to live young, whereas skates uh, lay eggs. Um, and that's the major difference between those two groups. So uh, rays play a role as mid-level predators, of course, as predators to uh, benthic invertebrates, um, but also as prey to larger sharks and marine mammals. And they are also called bioturbators. So um, when they're feeding, they actually dig these pits in the sand. And when they're doing that, they're releasing nutrients into the surrounding water column. But they're also creating this structure in the sediment where otherwise it was a flat environment. And that's actually making a, a habitat available to other smaller benthic organisms. So we talked a little bit about this on the boat um, the other day. I know a lot of you have seen this behavior where you'll see a jack, often a bar jack, following a stingray. It could be any bony fish, really. Um, we, see, we call this foraging facilitation. Uh, so other fish will follow stingrays as they're feeding and digging these pits. And that provides a quick snack to those uh, bony fishes. And when we're talking about ecology, some people forget that humans are a part of ecology. And so I always like to point out um, that we are part of that system. And so rays play an ecological role as tourism resources, bringing in thousands to millions of dollars to various countries every single year. And they're also a very valuable resource uh, for many nations around the world. So um, let's zo uh, zoom out to the status of rays globally. Uh, rays are one of the most threatened groups of vertebrates on the planet, next to amphibians. And in fact, 36% of them are threatened with extinction. So those are in the categories uh, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered, listed by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And they face many of the same threats as their shark cousins. Um, the largest threat is, of course, overfishing, uh, followed by habitat loss, climate change, and pollution. So rays face many of these same threats as sharks, yet they tend to garner less research attention, less funding, um, and there's really a lot of open questions uh, regarding uh, their biology, their life history, and their ecology. So let's now zoom into the Western Atlantic Ocean. We have a few abundance times, we have very few abundance time series for most ray species. Instead, what we have are landings and catch data, um, but those data are not really species specific, so it's very difficult to know what's going on. So in this graph, you have year on the x-axis, and we have landings in metric tons on the y-axis. And what I want you to notice about this figure is that up until about the early 1990s, uh, landings for both sharks and rays were increasing. But after that, they really stabilized or started to decline. So Venezuela, Mexico, and the United States uh, make up the largest por portion of landings in the Western Atlantic region. But there is some good news. Uh, rays are actually facing less of an extinction risk than sharks in the Western Atlantic Ocean. But in the Western Atlantic Ocean, uh, some countries do actually target rays in their fisheries. However, uh, their largest threat may actually be from bycatch. So even though they're caught in other fisheries, uh, fisher folk have been noting that they're still catching them to eat them or selling them or both. And of course, this study showed 
Um, one of the great ways to learn more about these fisheries is to go and directly talk with all the fisher folk and learn uh, what's going on. So one of the only regional data sets uh, and studies that has focused on rays is uh, actually on the uh, yellow stingray or the yellow round ray. Uh, this study used diver sightings from 1994 to 2007. And in this figure, just to explain it really quickly, because one like this will come up later on in the talk, anything that's to the left of that red dotted line represents a sighting's decline. Anything that's to the right of that red dashed line is going to represent a sighting's increase. And anything that's overlapping that red dashed line probably, re um, probably represents stability in sightings. And so the overall trend in the study showed that uh, yellow stingray sightings were declining, uh, particularly strong in the Florida Keys. Um, but there was an exception in Jamaica where sightings uh, actually increased. And the researchers hypothesized that this was due to release from predation from uh, larger predators like sharks and grouper who had been fished out. However, um, this, this idea has really not been tested thoroughly. So this brings me to one of the reasons why I'm here this week. Um, how can we really assess ray abundance and the status of their populations or better manage them if we don't really know what species are where? Um, and I want to give just an example here with a uh, species you're all very familiar with, the southern stingray. Um, so up until very recently, the southern stingray's range was the southeast United States into the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean Sea, and uh, down through to Argentina. Um, however, uh, their range just very recently got contracted, um, and Brazil became excluded from that range. And that's because a team of researchers uh, in Brazil, led by doc Dr. Flavia Pedian, they compared the DNA of the southern stingray and this stingray in Brazil and discovered that it was actually a new undescribed species. So that's despite their very visually shocking similarities. Uh, for most people, it's very difficult to tell these species apart. So we do need to look at their DNA um, or measure features like spherical length and the ventral tail fold length. And we talked about that a little bit yesterday. So here you can see this is the range now that the Lutz stingray is only found in Brazil. And we don't think that southern stingrays are overlapping with that species. Here in Seba and Stacia, there's possibly 14 to 19 species of ray. And I say possibly um, because there's a lot of unconfirmed uh, observations in the literature. Um, you all know that. I'm very uh, excited to be here this week hearing about the rough tail stingray. But everyone here knows that two of the more common species that you might see on a dive are, of course, the southern stingray and the white spotted eagle ray. So imagine my excitement when I was talking to Lynn and Emily for the first time, and they asked me to come talk about stingrays, particularly southern stingrays and rough tail stingrays. Because in our little science bubble, uh, we thought that the rough tail stingray range uh, did not include the Eastern Caribbean. So what we know from science and the literature, um, we don't really know that species to be living here in the Eastern Caribbean. In fact, very recently, some fisher folk um, in the southern Gulf of Mexico came forward and said, hey, we're landing these uh, rough tails. And some scientists they were working with published this. So already, uh, the range has been expanded to include the southern Gulf of Mexico. So um, the question still remains, because after our dive yesterday, we were not lucky in finding any rough tail stingrays. Um, whether or not that species actually is here or if it's perhaps a species misidentification. So um, I'm very hopeful that the more everyone keeps diving, uh, that we get a picture of a rough tail stingray and everyone can use their newly learned skills to, to send me an email and tell me about it. So I will be very excited. So now I'm going to jump ahead to the main focus of today's presentation and talk about some of the technology that I've used in my research to monitor rays and also use in uh, management. And those three technologies are accelerometry, acoustic telemetry, and baited remote underwater video stations. But fear not, I'm going to explain what all of those are. So let's first talk about accelerometry, with I, which I think some of our kids here tonight uh, probably know a little bit about after this week's activities. Um, so an accelerometer is actually 
something you're all very familiar with already. The technology is in your smartphone, and it helps orient the screen and flip it. Of course, mine's not going to do it right now, but it helps you read that text in the correct orientation when you flip your smartphone. It's also used to save thousands of lives every single year because it helps planes fly on autopilot, and it also helps uh, deploy airbags in vehicles. So. Um, what it does is it measures acceleration on the X, Y, and Z axes. And just to visualize this a little bit on array, what that might look like, we actually, uh, we can set it to record uh, diff at different frequencies, but we do 25 hertz, which is, of course, 25 data points per second. So imagine if we're deploying these for multiple days or months, how much data we're actually collecting from these animals. These tags also have a pressure sensor, which allows us to monitor water temperature and depth as well. So we put these accelerometers in a float package made of syntactic foam. We also have a VHF radio transmitter that will help with retrieval. We attach these tag packages to the back of Southern Stingrays with a galvanic release, and that galvanic release corrodes in salt water over the course of about three days, and um, that will help the tag float to the surface so we can go out and find it. And so once that animal is tagged and ready to go, we'll actually lift it back into the water and pray to the gods of every single religion that we get that tag back uh, and safely in our hands. So we have the data. Knock on wood, luckily so far, I have never lost one to the sea. So, <laughs> um, and then this is just a picture of uh, listening for that tag. So when the tag pops off, we have to listen uh, for the radio tag and go out and find where it is. So I'm going to zoom into one of my main study sites, which was in Belize. So uh, the red dot and the pink triangles are where I caught southern stingrays and tagged them with these accelerometers. This is just a quick look. Don't worry too much about this. This is just a quick look at what the raw data look like. On the x-axis is date and time. And then we have acceleration on the three axes and depth and temperature. What here, what I just wanted to point out is we can start to look at the differences between day and night patterns. So we turn those uh, acceleration data into what we call overall dynamic body acceleration, or ODBA. We simply separate the static acceleration due to gravity, and then we sum the absolute dynamic acceleration values across the three axes. And what we get are these really, this is for one individual southern stingray, is a graph that shows us sort of valleys, and those are, that's representing low activity, and the spikes are represent representing areas where that animal or individual was very active. We can then calculate the probability that stingrays are in a certain activity state, um, which we've used here as low, medium, and high, based on the time of day, water depth, and, depth, and temperature. Um, so this is just a graph showing um, the probability that uh, any given stingray in our whole data set um, was highly active or in a state of medium or low activity. And in, what's interesting to point out here is that most of the stingrays, when analyzed together, were most active just after sunset. And they also had this spike in medium activity uh, just after sunrise. But the probability of being in a low activity state or resting was very low throughout the entire course of the uh, acceleration deployments. I also wanted to point out, though, is that when we look at the individuals, we actually see very different patterns. So some individuals were very active at dawn, some were very active at dusk, some were very active throughout the night, and some throughout the day. So it appears that there's a really high degree of individual variation, which of course could be influenced by the size of the ray, uh, their body condition, whether or not they're hungry. Um, so these kinds of things can influence when they're active. Next, we looked at vertical activity, uh, also known as depth use. And what's really interesting here is that um, the large majority of stingrays, and this was also on the individual level basis, uh, were highly active in very, very shallow water, um, less than five meters of depth. And from the last slide, you might be tempted, like I was at first, to think that the southern stingrays um, were feeding in very shallow water. 
Um, however, we really should not do that because um, we're unable to link these activity states to actual behaviors. So in order to do that, we have to take the next step and deploy camera tags so we can actually watch what the animal's doing um, or put them in a semi-captive or captive environment where we can link specific behaviors to those signals in the acceleration data. So how do we use these data for management? Well, one of the best ways is actually to help fisher folk mitigate bycatch. So they might be targeting one species, um, but are catching a lot of stingrays. And actually, this happens a lot in catfish fisheries, where they set bottom long lines. They're catching a lot of stingrays. And so we can go out and we can tell them, hey, stingrays are most active um, at this time of the day and at this depth. So if you set your lines a little bit deeper and at this time, you might avoid catching that many stingrays. Um, we can also use these data to find important habitats. So, for example, at Glover's Reef Atoll, we know that the, um, the shallow areas less than five meters are actually seagrass beds and sand flats. And finally, we can use it to identify areas to include in larger movement studies, which brings me to our next technology, which is acoustic telemetry. I use one specific type of acoustic telemetry, which is passive acoustic telemetry. We have transmitters, that's what you see here up on the screen, that emit a sound about every one minute and 30 seconds. And this transmitter is implanted into the body cavity of the stingray. And we have listening stations that are set up all over um, our study sites so they pick up the detections of these tags. And every time one of the stingrays swims within the listing, the, the uh, detection range of the listing station, it records the date, the time, and the transmitter ID. So then we can take these data and start to get an understanding of their home range, their core use areas. I think some of the other scientists this week were talking about this for parrotfish. Um, so we can figure out whether or not their home bodies, are they living in a certain area for 12, year, uh, 12 months or more and really not moving outside of that area. We can also identify individuals that are potentially using an area disappearing but then coming back to that area afterwards. And uh, for management, we can use the, this information uh, to help us understand ray use of marine protected areas, which brings me back to Glover's Reef Atoll, which is one of my primary study sites. This was a marine protected area that was established in 1993. It has multiple use zones, uh, including the general use zone, a seasonal closure, closure zone up in the northeast for spawning Nassau grouper, and a replenishment zone in the southern portion of the protected area, which is also known as a no-take marine reserve. So absolutely no fishing can occur in that little triangle that you see there. So here's a map of where we placed all of our listening stations. And um, around the outside of the atoll, those purple dots, those were sort of at entrances into and out of the lagoon. Um, so we could kind of key in on key areas where the animals might be moving in and out. Um, but we also had them condensed here in the southern portion uh, along seagrass beds and sand flats, of course, to incorporate uh, primarily where the stingrays were living and where we were catching them. And this is just one representative example from one individual. Um, this, she actually spent most of her time closest to the area where she was tagged, which is the uh, little gray box with the black asterisk in the figure. Um, what's really interesting, too, is that most individuals really did not travel a large distance. Their core use area um, was less than a kilometer squared, and their general use area was less than two kilometers squared, um, which we see basically the 95% general use area is what's within um, those orange, that orange polygon. Uh, we can also look at their use of this habitat over time. So they're staying there, but they're also staying there for long periods of time and across years. Um, the differences you see here on, I don't think this is going to work, but you, here, um, those white spaces, those are just differences in tagging times. So we tag them at different periods. Um, but what, what's important about this graph is each individual black dot represents uh, at least one detection of the individual on any one of our receiver uh, or listening stations. And so individual stingray is on the vertical axis. Um, so again, this supports that the rays were not really moving out uh, onto the fore reef because those blue dots uh, represent movements onto the fore reef. So they were mostly staying in the lagoon and staying in very small areas. 
For spotted, white spotted eagle rays, we saw very similar behavior. They had very small core use areas. Uh, the difference being, of course, that they were more likely to travel between habitats. They were more likely to go out into the fore reef and then come back into the lagoon and continue that movement in and out. And then we were also opportunistically able to tag two Atlantic chupares. Um, these, this species was pretty rare. They're also known as the Caribbean whiptail stingray. Um, they're very, they've got a very rough back. I see everyone's eyes getting really big about what species is this. It's actually one of the species on the list uh, in Saba, so um, we can have a chat about this over beer after if anyone's seen this species. Um, but what we found for this one was very similar for the southern stingray. Despite it being a very large ray, um, it stayed within a very small core use area and uh, it was detected repeatedly uh, across multiple years. So this was really some good news. Most of the rays stayed mainly within the marine protected area boundaries across multiple years. Um, this information could be used to help design other protected areas for rays specifically. Um, it's important to note that this particular marine protected area was not actually designed for rays. It just so happens that it was working for rays. Um, for example, we know that white spotted eel rays tend to behave very differently. Some of you may remember Kim's talk. Um, from 2021, I know it was a while ago, but they tend to behave very differently along continental shelves, um, as well as in Florida. They make pretty long distance migrations and seasonal migrations, but we're really not seeing that at Glover's Reef Atoll. So we don't know why that is, why we're seeing the difference in behavior, but that's just to say that what works here might not work for management in other places. We really need to know the behavior of that animal and the specifics, the socioeconomic conditions in each uh, region to know what's gonna work for protection. And just one final note on movements. Uh, despite popular assumptions that stingrays are sedentary, they bury themselves in the sand and they don't go very far, um, this is just one example of a stingray, the small eye stingray, that actually is known to make a 400 kilometer return mi migration off the coast of Mozambique in Africa. And you may remember uh, Atlantine uh, Bogio Pasqua. She was also here with Kim in 2021. Uh, she was the scientist who discovered this incredible movement, um, and it is the largest distant mi distance migration that we know of for a stingray to date. Um, and she used something as simple as photo ID to be able to look at this. She didn't even need acoustic telemetry to do this. Um, and that brings me to my next technology, which involves cameras as well, which are baited remote underwater video stations. Um, <clears throat> bruvs, I'll refer to them as bruvs. It's a little bit easier to say. Uh, what is a bruv? Well, quite simply, it's a GoPro camera that sits on top of a frame. And we have a bait arm that extends about 1.5 meters in front of the camera. On the end of that is some oily bait fish, usually a, a kilogram of it. And that bait attracts predatory fishes into the field of view of the camera, including bony fishes, sharks, and rays. So how do we turn those numbers in, uh, turn those animal observations into numbers? Well, we use this metric called max n, which is the maximum number of individuals in frame at once per hour. And this is on a species level basis. So now that you've all seen that video, I know it was quick. Any guesses as to how many stingrays were in that video? Three, he got it. Oh, come on, Otto. <laughs> Definitely, we had three. So this is actually Lutz's stingray, although it looks exactly like the southern stingray. This is the one that was described in Brazil. This, this, these videos come from Brazil. So there were three Lutz's stingrays here. And for those of you who love stingrays like me, you might have been paying so close attention to the rays that you missed that shark swimming by. But there was also a shark in frame. Um, so we watched 60 minutes of footage, uh, sometimes a little bit longer, depending on the research question, um, to look for maxen for each of the species. So we can then turn max n into things like species incidence and occurrence, which has been done very well and very recently by Dr. Twan Stoffers, who uh, was here in the Dutch Caribbean working specifically in Seba and St. Eustatius. So him and his team set many, many bruvs around, and they found that the two most common shark species were the Caribbean reef shark, as well as the nurse shark, and occasional visitors were tiger sharks, um, great hammerheads, black tips, and even silky sharks. So bruvs can also be used for long-term abundance monitoring. So again, we're gonna head back to Glover's Reef Atoll. This time we're gonna focus in on a very small area in that blue polygon that you see in the southern portion of the atoll. 
That's the area where we were setting our uh, BRUV standardly from 2009 to 2019. So here we were able to look at trends over time because we standardly monitored these populations. Um, and within the no-take marine reserve, we actually found, the graph looks a little bit different there, but it's okay. Um, th we actually found uh, that southern stingrays, their sightings or their abundance was uh, stable throughout that entire time period, which might not be that surprising given what we know about their movements. They're not really moving in and out of the marine protected area boundaries. However, we did find that Caribbean reef sharks uh, had declined because they were using more of the coral reef habitat off the edge of the slope. We know from previous studies that they can dive down to depths greater than 300 meters. Um, so they didn't really care about that NPA boundary that humans created. They were swimming in and out of it. And we know uh, that fisher folk were actually targeting them on the edge of the reef around this time period. So what we did is we shared our results with the National Shark Working Group, which is comprised of local stakeholders, uh, including fisher folk, tourism, tourism or organizations, NGOs, and government officials. And we made recommendations to extend the marine protected area boundaries specifically for sharks. And so in 2021, um, these officially became known as the shark protected areas. And there are now 3.2 kilometer buffer zones around the three coral reef atolls that are uh, protected areas. Woo! <laughs> So we have to celebrate our wins. We don't do that enough in science. I think everyone back there can agree. Um, so now I'm going to pivot to how we use these data in spatial comparisons. So um, I was lucky enough to work with Global FinPrint. If you have the chance afterwards, check it out. Um, around the world, we set over, like, what, 20,000 bruvs um, on 272 coral reefs. Um, to compare uh, the abundance of sharks and rays and their diversity. Um, I specifically honed in on the Greater Caribbean region where we had about 3,000 hours of footage. Um, we set these randomly at depths between 2 to 40 meters and we analyzed the footage to 60 minutes in all of these different places. And some of these places had multiple coral reef sites. I'm not going to get into this because it's a lot of text, but this is just to show you that I wanted to know what factors were affecting southern stingray abundance in these places, so I looked at a variety of factors. I will just point out that uh, market gravity might not be something everyone's used to hearing. Uh, market gravity is a way to measure human pressure, which is a function of travel time to the nearest market and the size of human population at that market. It's a little tricky to wrap your head around at first, but it's really a, a way to measure human pressure on fish populations. So one of the main findings was that southern stingray sightings um, were higher in open flat habitat compared to areas that had highly structural complexity. And this could be because they prefer these beautiful soft bottom habitats. That's where their prey are distributed. Um, but it also could be because um, in structurally complex habitats, if rays are hiding in that reef structure or swimming behind it and actually present, we might not be able to detect it. So bruvs are really the only thing we have currently to look at southern stingray sightings in abundance in the region. So it's like the best thing we have currently, but just keep in mind as I go through these results, we might have a bit of a survey bias here. So I also found that there were more southern stingrays in places where there were fewer sharks. If you want to know more about that, ask me over beer. I have a lot to say about it. <laughs> um, we also found that uh, there were higher stingray sightings around islands, both high islands and low islands, compared to the continental shelf. And we found that southern stingrays were more uh, commonly sighted in really warm water temperature, which reflects uh, their, their thermal range and preference and their tropical nature. So that was not necessarily surprising. And finally, we found that countries that used bottom fishing gear had fewer rays sighted, um, also maybe not surprising. Um, so one of the potential management recommendations to come out of this work is that uh, uh, gear restrictions are likely to be a very effective way uh, to protect rays. But I used them a little bit differently um, to take these data and protect rays in Belize. Belize is really unique because they don't actually target rays in their fisheries, but they do catch them as bycatch. 
And rays are really, really important to uh, their tourism, tourism industry. And if we just look at the results for all stingrays combined, not just southern stingrays, this is all species, and we're looking at uh, abundance on the y-axis and the different countries and territories on the x-axis, Belize came in fifth for ray abundance in the entire greater Caribbean region. And when we look at a species richness, or the number of species present, um, Belize had the second highest uh, number of species detected in the region. So by all accounts, rays seem to be doing quite well uh, in Belize. So um, I was talking with uh, Miss Beverly Wade at the fisheries department. She was the former fisheries administrator. And because I'm Canadian, you can all agree, I decided I needed to be polite and talk to her, talk to the local people, and figure out how I could make my research useful for management, but also figure out some of their, their needs in research. And in doing so, we got to talking about stingrays. And um, she, in sharing these results, she got very, very excited. And she said, what can we do to protect them? Um, and so we started discussing this with the National Shark Grouping, Working Group. And together, we came up um, with this idea to create a ray sanctuary where absolutely no commercial fishing could occur in an area uh, that's 36 kilometers squared, uh, which is about the size of the state of Maryland. So in 20. Uh, 20, this became official legislation, and all rays are currently protected in Belize. And you might be thinking, yeah, woo, yay! <laughs> so you might be thinking, well, why protect them if they weren't really being targeted? Well, um, this was really a proactive measure to prevent them from being fished in the future and to prevent a fishery from developing, which became very important in 2020 because Belize also banned the use of gill nets. And this displaced a lot of fisher folk. They lost a lot of their livelihoods. And so they have started to look for alternative income. Um, and the stingrays were their next big target, given that they catch them so frequently as bycatch. So there's still a lot of work to do in figuring out how to enforce this moving forward and monitor it. But um, this is a great start to prevent those fisheries from development. So um, to conclude, um, at the heart of hands-on learning and experiential learning is natural history. And natural history is where we go out and we just observe species in their natural environment. Is, and that's a lot like what we've been doing here this month. Um, and unfortunately, natural history in our field is uh, really dying. Um, and so I think it's time that we need to revive it because when we're out there observing species in their natural environment, we can actually come up with much better questions. And then we can use technology to answer those questions. And I think that technology, in part, has actually led to uh, uh, natural history becoming a dying field. So we kind of need to flip that and reverse the order in which we do things. Um, we also need to go back to the basics because we really don't know a lot about the life history and ecology of these rays and what species are where. So we really need to focus on basic questions before we start jumping into more uh, complex questions. And one of the best ways to do this is not always through big technology, but also through big collaborations, which Ian talked about in his presentation this week. Um, we really need to be working directly with resource users and local communities. Um, which is what we've been doing in Belize since 2018. We've been working with the, directly with the Riversdale shark fishing community. And what we do is um, we pay them to help us come do our research. And in doing so, it's reduced shark landings by approximately 40% in that time period. So every day they're working with us, um, they reduce the number of days that they go fishing. And so this has been a really great collaboration. We're also learning a lot from them and their knowledge over the generations. Um, and because of that knowledge, we've actually just started a new project for my postdoc where we're monitoring the abundance of coastal stingray species um, and looking at what factors are affecting their distribution. So it's been a really great collaboration so far. And finally, um, other uh, local communities and resource users are it's users as everyone here in the room, um, all of the divers. And you can really participate in science in many different ways by being here and learning about the research, but also any observations uh, that you see, you can upload them to iNaturalist, where nerds like me spend hours looking at pictures of rays and trying to look for those different ones that may be somewhere and helping people identify what species they're seeing. And then, of course, you can participate in uh, diver surveys, which contributed to that yellow stingray 
uh, study with uh, Reef Environmental Education Foundation, which has been doing these surveys since 1993. Um, and so th these data can really help us expand and extend ranges for different species and identify areas of potentially rare and endangered species, so areas that are important for those threatened species. So uh, one of my favorite collaborations between divers and scientists brought us to the discovery that stingrays make sound. And this is something that we did not think was possible for uh, cartilaginous fishes. Um, and this was very, very recent. So I'm going to end my talk today, not with a bang, but with a click. So make sure to listen to this video. <laughs> so it was actually uh, multiple divers uh, have observed this behavior and finally reached out uh, to Dr. Joni Penny Fitzsimmons, uh, who uh, led the study with Lachlan Fetter Place. And um, they, the scientists really don't know. We don't really know the mechanism that's uh, producing that sound. Of course, the Lazarus fishes don't have a swim bladder, uh, but we think that the mechanism producing the sound is the closure, rapid closure of the spiracle um, and the gills at the same time. That's creating that clicking noise. And it tends to happen when they feel very threatened. And I've actually never, I've been in the water a lot, and I'm sure all of you have with stingrays, and I've never heard this um, before. But keep your ears out. You never know um, what you're going to hear. And um, these kinds of observations, again, I just want to wrap it up that um, these kinds of observations by divers and working with fisher folk can really help us improve our knowledge um, on these majestic sea creatures. So with that, um, I just want to thank you all again for being here and listening to my talk and, of course, support. Uh, say thank you to all of my incredible supporters. Um, and with that, feel free to write down my contact information because I want to hear about all your amazing ray observations. Um, and let's connect afterwards. So I'm just putting this up here. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but have a look at this species list. If you have questions afterward, we can, afterwards, we can talk about it. A lot of these we don't really know if it's true, if they're here or not. Maybe they were here before, but they're not anymore. Um, so please, um, we can talk about this a little more after, but I'll open the floor uh, to any questions. Yeah, so we actually don't have a good idea. Um, so her question was whether the warming of the water temperatures is affecting the stingrays. And right now, we don't really have a good idea of how climate change, including increasing water temperatures, is influencing their movements. Obviously, the southern stingrays seem to prefer uh, warmer water temperatures. So there might be some winners, and there might be some losers. And that's going to be on a species-specific basis. How many species of Alaska brains have been observed making sounds? So the question was, how many species of elasmobranchs have been observed making sounds? And to date, um, I believe, if I recall correctly, there were two species in that study, the mangrove whip ray, which you just saw there, and the cowtail stingray. I'd have to go back just to verify that. But um, to my knowledge, there haven't been any other species. Um, I was curious about your match trick, like the max n. Mm -hmm. So I guess I was kind of surprised to see that it was below one. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, like, what effect sizes are you looking for? And what's kind of the difference that you'd say, oh, this is like a high ray site versus a low ray site? Yeah, great question. So the question was, uh, he wanted to know a little bit more about the metric that I'm using max n, because he noticed that it was less than 1. And so we're using the average max n or the mean max n per coral reef area. And so we have a lot of videos that have absolutely nothing on it. So we have a lot of zeros in our data. And then we also have a lot of ones or some twos. But those, uh, the data are really zero inflated. Um, so that's why you're seeing those values below 1. And if you look back, let's see if I can quickly get back to it uh, to answer the second part of your question. Um, this is really just basic uh, mean, ray, max, n, and standard error. There's not, there was this particular part of the study, there was no um, statistical analysis. Um, but we see that a lot of the standard error bars are actually overlapping. And so 
there's not that big of a difference between Ray sightings throughout the entire region. It's really the Ray sightings were quite low and the same in many different places. And in Montserrat, it looks like there might be a bit of a difference. However, they actually used a different bait type. They're the only place that used gar as bait. So we can kind of ignore that because we don't know if that uh, use of a different bait type is confounded um, it, within the study. But everywhere else used the same bait. So Montserrat, it could be because it's a high island and they really like high islands, but it could also be because of that bait. Um, and then, of course, in, my, um, in the spatial comparison part of the project, um, we actually found our, I, I have an assumption that you know a little bit about math and modeling. Yeah, okay, so we, um, we actually found that the random effect of location uh, explained most of the, the model's variance. So, uh, and uh, variations, excuse me. So we think that probably we're not monitoring the right factors that are actually determining where rays are and their abundance. So we have a lot more work to do for sure. Mm -hmm. of, uh, of mm -hmm. and if the descendants uh, stay in the same area or if they migrate? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So he wants to know more about the gestation period of stingrays and whether the descendants actually stay in the same area. So for the first part of the question, for southern stingrays, their gestation period is seven months approximately. And um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a study looking to see if the offspring also stay in the same area. So that would be a great area of research moving forward. Yeah, so Otto had a great question as well, and he wants to know whether rays move across deep water. Um, there might be some really great research questions uh, to come about from this. And we actually don't, specifically here, there's been no movement studies on your rays, um, but rays do sometimes cross deeper waters, but for a lot of benthic stingrays, we don't have the movement data. Uh, there are very, very few studies on the movements of rays um, that's starting to pick up in the last couple years. Um, but this is a, another avenue of research that really needs to be expanded. We've had some situations here where, like, nurse sharks have been caught in traps on the Sabre Bank, brought in, tagged, and, like, two weeks later, they show up in the Sabre Bank again. Yeah. In the same traps, in the same area. <laughs> yeah, so he gave the example of the nurse sharks that have been tagged. They're they swim on the surface, do they swim on the bottom, where do they swim? Right, so he gave the example of the nurse sharks that are tagged, they're out on the bank, and then they're getting caught and coming back in here. Well, nurse sharks are actually known to make large distance migrations. I think they're another species where people think, oh, they sit on the bottom and they don't really move that much. But no, we actually, in our movement study, tagged 30 uh, nurse sharks. We have an incredible PhD student, Megan Kelly, at Florida International University, who's finishing up that project. And she found that the nurse sharks are making really long distance migrations. They're really moving out of our array. Um, and so this also happens in Florida during mating season. So it's no surprise that they're doing that here as well. Um, and nurse sharks are probably staying close to the bottom. And I think that probably benthic stingrays, if moving between islands, they're also staying close to the, to the bottom. Of course, um, semi-pelagic species like white spotted eagle rays or cow nose rays uh, or pelagic species like devil rays and manta rays, they of course would be up in the water column making those uh, longer distance migrations between islands. There's also um, a pelagic stingray, looks very much like a southern stingray, has a totally uh, dark underbelly, so there's absolutely no white. Um, that species, although it looks like a southern stingray, it, do stingray, it does live up uh, in the water column entirely. How deep can they dive, the southern stingrays? Yeah. So I believe that the deepest that they've been recorded is about 70 meters, 70 to 80 meters. Um, but we suspect that they dive much, much deeper. We just haven't actually had the studies to look at their depth use. But in, at Glover's Reef Atoll, I never actually had any of the individuals dive deeper than 20 meters. Um, but this, of course, we had very short deployment durations across three days, so we weren't getting a large uh, sample size across time. Um, and also, the structure of the atoll itself is that within the lagoon area, it doesn't get deeper than 20 meters. So that also supports our movement data. We saw that they were staying inside of the lagoon um, and not really moving out, and so they were within that 20-meter depth contour. 
Yeah, that's a great question. How do you catch a ray to tag it? So there's many different rays, uh, ways that we can do it. Uh, we actually started out our research using long lines, and they were bycatch on the shark research long lines. Um, so we started just working them up um, when they were on the shark long lines. We actually even caught a white spotted URA as bycatch on a long line, which was kind of unexpected. Um, but um, we started working with Fisher Folk and one of our first mates, uh, Ashbert Miranda, who is such a pleasure to work with. You might have seen him in some of the videos and pictures. He's been a, he was a Fisher Folk uh, or fisherman before uh, working with us, and he decided that we should switch to cast nets. And so uh, we would actually chase rays into extremely shallow water, and he would throw the cast net, and we would actually bring them up onto the boat. And so that was a little bit, it's a little less stressful for them because they're not hooked on the line for a really long time. But for our new abundance monitoring program, we are still continuing with bottom long lines because it is still one of the better ways to catch a lot of rays and relatively quickly. Yeah, so the question was, do remoras really have a symbiotic relationship with rays? And the answer is yes. Um, so we do see shark suckers and remoras hitching a ride on the back of stingrays, um, but also mostly on, on white spotted eagle rays and manta rays and devil rays. Um, and so that relationship ne isn't necessarily always beneficial uh, or, or neutral. It actually can cause harm to the ray. Um, it, just staying there a little bit too long can cause damage uh, to their mucus barrier. Um, but it's not just remoras that have a symbiotic relationship. We also know that other organisms like octopuses um, and even other stingrays will hitch a ride on the back of stingrays um, to travel long distances and try to hide from predators. So if you ever have the chance to Google uh, hitchhiking stingrays or piggybacking stingrays and hitchhiking octopus, do that because they're really cool observations. You're welcome. So now to the good stuff that everyone's been waiting for. <laughs> Who's ready to win? All right, our first prize for this evening is a three-night stay at the penthouse at the Cottage Club. So drum roll, please. The winner is, and I have to remember what, what I did, K and T, K and T, who is K and T? K and T, I don't remember who I wrote this for, K and T, yeah, I wrote it. Well, congratulations K and T. <laughs> All right, the next prize is three free tennis lessons with Lynn. Big prize, big prize. McDuffie, McDuffie. Michelle McDuffie, you won tennis lessons with Lynn. She's back in February, okay. Next up is Seva's Sea to Scenery Coffee Table Book. Yeah, at the end. And the winner is Jeff Joshua? Joshua? I'm Jeff Jeff Johnson. Jeff Johnson. Jeff Johnson. Next up is a sunset cruise for two on the Lombada, which is Aquamania in St. Martin. And the winner is Lenny. Lenny from C. Seva. <laughs> you and Lenny can have a cute date. Next up is a round trip ticket on the Makana Ferry to any of the destinations that they service. So St. Kitts, Stacia, St. Martin. Miami. 
And the winner is Lindsay Hebner. And next up is, we have two prizes. It's two different necklaces made by Hanukkah from Seba Fines. And the first necklace goes to Kurt. Kurt. Kurt, congrats, Kurt. And the second necklace goes to McKenna. Beth and Tom McKenna, congrats. Next up is a dinner for two at the Brigadoon. You want that one? The winner is Rachel. Rachel from Busy Bee, I'm guessing, yes. Congrats, Rachel. Next up, we have a three nice day at Flamboyant Cottage. Thank you to Larry and Sherry for sponsoring. And the winner is Jethro, Jethro Doll, <laughs> who's now on Stacia, so now you have to come back and visit me. <laughs> Next up is a wine basket from Shea Booba Bistro. Shake this a little bit more. <laughs> and the winner is Katinka Boss. Congratulations, Katinka. <laughs> Our next raffle prize is a beautiful silver clay piece of jewelry by Anise. It is an octopus tentacle, and it's really awesome. <laughs> So the winner of this lucky prize is Larry and Sherry. Oh. Yay. <laughs> Next up, we have a Create Your Own Garden with local artist Helene Cornet. She has free pottery lessons and materials for a month. So the winner of this beautiful prize is Katinka again. Congratulations, Katinka. Do you go, yeah. Next. Oh, where did Otto go? Otto left just in time for the Sea Saba prize. There's a Sea Saba Sunset Cruise for six. And that winner is Popeye and Grace. Congrats. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. We'll go with you. <laughs> you have four extra people to take. Just saying. <laughs> next, next prize is a three-night stay at the beautiful Spyglass Villa. Another drum roll for this prize, please. And the winner is Mark Boyson. <laughs> Congrats, Mark. Next up is a cloud top card making class for two with Daniela Dunlop, the owner of Hideaway. And the winner is Duco. <laughs> Congrats, you made it. <laughs> Next up, we have another three night stay at Windsong Villa. Drum roll, please. And the winner is Larry and Sherry. Can we get the knife prize? Did you know about the knife that it was coming up? I didn't. Next up is a handcrafted no, Triton Forge knife. You don't want the wind song? No. Yeah. Okay. Place to stay here. We don't need this. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So now we have another lucky opportunity to win a three night stay at Windsong. And the winner is Popeye and Grace. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right. 
<laughs> More raffle tickets you buy, it really pays. So now we have a handcrafted knife by Triton Forge. You want that too? Yes. Uh, yeah, I want that. I want that. You want that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many tickets did you buy? The winner is our host for this evening, Mike from Long Haul. Our next prize is a dinner for two at the hideaway. And the winner is Tom and Beth McKenna. Congratulations. And one of our big prizes for this year is a one week, seven nights, Stay for two at Banana Keat House in St. Croix. Thank you, Tim. And the winner is M.A. Venneberg. M.A. Venneberg. Congratulations. <laughs> And last but not least is a one-week stay on the Caribbean Explorer 2 live aboard. Eight days, seven nights, includes accommodation, meals, drinks, and diving. <laughs> and the winner is... Rachel from Busy Bee. <laughs> So that wraps up our uh, See and Learn 2023. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Yeah. Thank you for Long Haul for hosting five presentations this year. Thank you so much. And if you guys could help us move the chairs, we need to set this back up as a restaurant. And we will see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.